before I turn it over to Rabbi Kasurla for tonight's fantastic lecture, I just want to offer uh, our gratitude to Lenny and Khan, Grun, Len, Khani and Len Grunstein for sponsoring the series in memory of their fathers, Morris Grunstein and Aaron Tambor. Our learning tonight and throughout the series should be an aliyah for their neshamas, and we're very appreciative for your sponsorship. We are obviously here on Tuesday nights. There are a couple of breaks in the series, so pay attention to the schedule. So, for example, we're off next week because of Hanukkah, then we're back on, and then we're off for Asar Batavis. So at the beginning, it's a little choppy, and then once we build up some momentum, we'll be going straight from there on in. And without further ado, I give you the most energetic rabbi in the community, <laughs> Rabbi Yosef Kasorla. Oh, my. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Good evening. My daughter on my way out of the house, she said, Abba, why are you going? And I'm like, in all honesty, I don't know why. I really don't know why me. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank the Grunstein family so much. It's really such an amazing thing. I love getting the emails of the Debre Torah. We're kindred spirits. I love it. Bezrat Tashem has said in Daf Yomi, the biggest bracha I could give to you, like the famous song, Ilan Ilan. I'm telling your family is incredible. May you continue having many, many, many more years of supportive Torah and only, only great things for your entire family, Bezrat Hashem. Uh, so tonight, tonight, we're going to talk about something very, very controversial. Very, very controversial. Because we could spend hours upon hours upon hours talking about the Rambam. But yet tonight, I actually ran into somebody. I'm not going to say what type of Hasidus he was from. <laughs> this is me. This is me when I was seven years old. Seven years old. Hami Tannenbaum just asked me, Rabbi, why is it you always get the Svartim? I said, listen, Lubav Terebi, he gave me a special beracha. I should have an impact on Svartim. So please, God, Bezrat Hashem, hopefully what we speak about today. I did tell this person, don't come to this lecture. Trust me, do not come to this lecture because I don't know how much you're going to enjoy it, especially versus Yat Kislev. So we're talking today about the Almohads, about the Almohads. So there's a famous, famous joke that they say that one time there were two briskers sitting in Shemayim and they're learning a Rambam and they're going back and forth and back and forth and they don't understand it. And who happens to be there in heaven? The Rambam. And the Rambam walks by and they say, well, Rambam, come over here, come over here. And he says, and he explains to them beautifully. He says it so nicely. And then finally, once the Rambam leaves, one of the briskers looks at the other one and says, oh, do you like his explanation? So he turned to him, he said, Ah, that guy's Sparty. What does he know about the Rambam? <laughs> so tonight, tonight I'm Sparty, of course, as always. And I'm going to talk a bit about the Rambam and about a certain point of his life, and a certain point of his life that people really just don't talk so much about. So before I begin, oh, this is the Rambam statue in Cordoba. I'm going to say it two different ways because there's actually two different ways of saying it. Now, I wrote rolling in his grave. Why is that? If you look on the bottom right over here, you notice it's super, super shiny. It's very, very shiny. Because in Spain, before a couple gets married, a non-Jewish couple, they go to the Rambam statue, and for good luck, they rub the little foot of the Rambam, and it gives them good luck. If you know anything about the Rambam, he's rolling in his grave, whether it's in Tiberia or Egypt, he's rolling in his grave. Because, I mean, this is so anathema to everything that he was. So before I begin, I need to give you guys everything first. None of this is mine. All of this is stuff that I've taken, especially, especially from this amazing book over here. My, what, sorry, Maimonides in his world. This is fantastic by Professor Sarah Shrumsa. We're going to be quoting, quoting from it quite a bit, quite a bit. But in addition, Dr. Halberdahl's book, which is fantastic. My Rebbe, his father, Dr. Isidore Torsky. There's Yishal Leibowitz. I got this out of Seamus. It was worth it. Obviously, Dr. Mark Shapiro, who I love so much, who's always so generous with his time. He's incredible. Uh, Mori Viribi, Rabbi Dr. Deva Katz, who's amazing, who runs an incredible, incredible podcast, who runs an incredible podcast network. Very, very, very highly suggested. And also the collected essays of Dr. Grach, of Chaim Soloveitchik, which there's so much to talk about, but we'll get into this. So any mistakes, I can tell you right now, are all mine. Anything good comes from these sources. Nothing comes from me. So let us begin. There are four distinct periods in the Rambam's life, four of them. Number one is when he's born. And the Rambam is born, there's a whole bunch of discussion, 1135, 1138, 
Most scholars say 1138. And from 1138 until he was 10 years old, he was living in Cordova. And it was a type of life that was fantastic. You had so much religious freedom to a certain degree. His father was a respected Dayan, a rabbinical judge. Things were awesome. Things were great. And he was living, the group was called the Almoravids. And they were pretty good. They were very, very good to the Jews, as long as Jews followed a certain thing, as we're going to discuss in a little bit. In 1148, everything changed. In 1148, that's the Almohad conquest. This is going to be what we're talking about tonight. These are going to be 17 full years of the Rambam's life. 17 full years under Almohad rule. And it was not good, as we're going to discuss, for one major reason. Unlike most Muslims, they believe that you are able. And not only are you able, you must forcibly convert those dimmi, those people who are the al al katab, those people who are people of the book. You need to convert those people. And the Rambam was living under this area between 1148 and eventually 1171. In, 11, in 1165, his family ended up moving. In 1165, his family moved to Fatimid, Egypt. And it was a pretty, pretty good area. It was pretty good at that point. It was pretty good. But then also in 1171, the Ayubis took over. And that's where you have the famous Saladin. And this is very famous where the Rambam was his doctor. Maybe he was his deputy's doctor. A lot to talk about. But we actually spoke about this a long time ago. Look on Yu Torah. We could literally spend hours and hours and hours talking about the Rambam and his whole history. And I want to keep it very, very short tonight. So what is fascinating is, is that time under the Amohads. What was it like for the Rambam living under this oppressive group, especially for 17 whole years? Can we possibly see any sort of influence in the Rambam and his thought? Is it possible? Some of it might come from the Amohads. So before we really continue, we got to get into a little bit of Islamic history. Not so much time, but a good amount for us to really understand what's going on. In 711, in 711, you have the Moors crossing the Straits of Gibraltar, coming into Spain, and knocking out the Visigothic Christian Hispania. They take over Spain in 711. In eight years, in eight years, they take over almost all of Spain. And if you notice over here, they leave a very, very small piece at the top. They are unable to conquer that. That's the famous, if you notice over here, let me show you. Ah, I don't have it over. Oh, yeah, here it is. The Battle of Tours or Poitiers, which is the famous Charles Martel. Historians say that this is probably the most important battle that ever happened because Charles Martel was able to stop the Berbers and able to stop the Muslims from coming into Europe. And Europe at this point was a political disaster. And it was actually possible for the Muslims to overrun all of Europe. But yet Charles Martel at this battle is able to stop them. And that means that there's no Charlemagne. There's no Holy Roman Empire. And also it means there's no papal states. Whether that's good for us, that's a different discussion. So, But for Muslim Spain, it meant that there would always be this northern part, which was always trying to reconquer, as we all know, the Reconquista. That constantly is trying to reconquer the south and take it back from the Muslims. So little by little, this area metastasizes. And little by little, this area goes lower and lower and lower. If you notice over here, let's go back a little bit, sorry. If you notice this area over here, I'll show you guys in a little bit, this area becomes more and more and more Christian. This area is what we know is where the Ramban comes from. It's where certain other great, great rabbis like the Me'iri come from, different rabbis who knew about Christianity particularly well because they grew up in this northern area, which happens to be Christian, which is Christian. So this area is metastasizing, and it keeps on going more and more south. The problem with that is that if you are Muslim, it's very problematic because it means what is the main reason why we're losing so much land in Al-Andalus? 
Why are we losing so much land in Spain to the Christians? It must be due to our own moral defects. It must be due to our own religious defects. And therefore, you can already start seeing there's a situation that's ripe for a type of religious extremism, as we're going to discuss. Religious extremism. So what was the situation for the Jews? What was the situation for the Jews in Muslim Spain? Uh, since Muhammad really passed away in 632, since Muhammad passed away, there were four major caliphs. And they were called the Rashidun. And these four caliphs were the most important in, in, in early Islam. And the reason why is because this, with the death of Ali, you end up with the major, major fight between Ali's son. He gets martyred. And that's how you have the major difference between the Shiites, who make up about 20% of the Arab world, and you have the Sunni, which make up 80% of the Arab world. But what we really care about so much is this particular caliph. The second caliph, according to tradition, made a special dispensation for a group called al al Katab. Katab, obviously from the same word, Katab, which means people of the book. And who are the people of the book? The people of the book are Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians. It's very interesting. They say that since these groups do adhere, this is what the Pact of Omar, since they adhere to a type of Abrahamic religion to a certain degree, and since they adhere to the Bible, therefore, and Jesus was an absolute real prophet according to them, and Moses was a real prophet according to them, therefore, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, and a few other groups, they are able to totally practice their religion as long as they do a few things. The major thing that people know about is something called the jizya. The jizya was a special religious poll tax that Jews needed to pay. At certain points, it was more oppressive. At other points, it was less oppressive. But the point is, if you paid the money, you can have absolute religious freedom. Another famous one is, is you're not allowed to build any new synagogues. You could only make up old synagogues. So, you know, Casablanca, I'm shocked, shocked to see new synagogues because at certain points, depending on how much money really ended up trading hands and depending on how much the particular ruler really wanted to really keep this pact of Omar, as much as the person want, as much as the ruler wanted to, that's how much Jews had that amount of freedom. And sometimes it was better and as sometimes it was worse. But the point is, is that as long as Jews adhere to certain things, like no riding on horses, for example. Like, for example, you can't have a synagogue being taller than a mosque. For a lot of Sometimes you even had to wear separate clothing. Many different things. As long as Jews stayed in their lane, things were okay. Things were okay. But it all changed with the Amohads. They all changed. And what's interesting is, is that the time before the Amohads, you had this golden age of Jewish Spain. We had some of the greatest leaders possible. One of my favorites is Rabbi Shlohan Nagid, who knew Shas. He knew it so well, but also he was a real military leader, leading his troops into battle. He has this beautiful letter to his son, Yosef, who ended up dying on Kiddush Hashem. Here's a book for you called from the best of Arabi's rich tongue and copied by me while the sword is drawn and the spear gleams deadly in our hands. Death orders about armies, requisitioning now this, now that one's youth. But even as the grave yawns wide around me, I can't stop educating you. I'd rather see you with some learning than all my enemies routed from the field. And that's really the personality of who he was. And that's why he opened up his own yeshiva. The yeshiva was very famous, called Lucina. Very interesting. That's where the riff was the Rosh Hashiva. And for our purposes, it's where Rav Yosef Ibn Migash, the Rimigash, he followed his Rebbe, the riff, as the Rosh Hashiva. What I love so much about this is that we all know the towering intellect of the Rambam. Yet the Rambam writes about the Rimigash that his mind was frightening. For the Rambam to write this about the Rimigash, I can't even imagine, I can't even imagine how amazing he was. So you had so many great, great team, and you had Rabbi Hura Levi, for example, you had Rabbi Nubachia, you had so many great, great Sadiqim living during this time. 
Now, you don't have the same thing going on in Ashkenaz. And the question is, why? It's pretty simple. Because for us Jews, the, the church culture was not something that was particularly accessible or really impressive to us. In Spain and in the Arabic world, especially at this time, there's so much science, especially the Greco-Roman sciences, which are just translated, like Aristotle, as we're going to talk about a lot. All of these things were now translated into Arabic and was being shared in the Arabic world. In fact, so much so, most scholars say that this preservation of the Greco-Roman canon is what caused the Renaissance to happen in the 15th century because these, these Muslims preserved these Greco-Roman ideas and, and allowed them to pass on to generations until, until the Italian Renaissance. So it wasn't really something that was such a yeser hara for the Jews. Because if you're living in Ashkenaz, what exactly, what access do you have to anything? And even that, everything's very, very religious. Everything is based around the church. So that was not really something that was so much of a yeser hara for Jews. Not at all. Not at all. And that's why I find it interesting that what was the big thing that flowered in Ashkenaz? The big thing was the baliat tosafot, the baliat tosfos who their whole idea is a dialectical idea of where they turn inward and look at the shas. That's what they care about. They care about what's going on in their own Gemara, as opposed to what's going on in Spain. In Spain, there's the writing of Hebrew poetry. In Spain, there's a reading of philosophy. In Spain, you have already the beginnings of this amazing Hebrew grammar that so much is back today because of our amazing state of Israel. So. You had this phenomenon in the Arab world where you had someone who was a great, great, great Sadiq, but they also had secular learning. You had someone, for example, like the Rambam's father, who was a Dayan, a seventh generation Dayan, but he was also an MD. He was also a doctor. That was something you didn't have in Ashkenaz. That's not something that was even possible. And, and in the Arab world, the language of Arabic was something that Jews knew particularly well. So much so that if you look at it, the Chovad al and Rav Sadia Gon, and Ibn Gabiro, and even some of the poems, poems of Rav Yudai Levi are written specifically in Arabic or Judeo-Arabic, written in Arabic. And that means they are part and parcel of this Muslim culture that's flowering around them. So one of these Gedolim was Rav Maimon. And Rav Maimon was the Rambam's father, and he was incredible. He was a main student of the Rimigash, and you can see how great he was based on his son. One thing that we have, we don't have much Torah from Rav Maimon, but one thing, especially for this time of year, is he brings down the custom of eating things that are dipped in oil. This time of year during Hanukkah, so when you're eating your latkes, eating your sufganyot, that's an old custom that already Rav Maimon himself records. He records it. So the Rambam was born 1138, and his mother passed away in childbirth. And he learned with his father. He had such a bond with his father. And his father was a Dayan, which means he's not necessarily learning Gemara in a much more polemic way. He's learning it, the term is called, Aliba de Hilchasa. It's in order to really come to an absolute conclusion about the matter. You're not trying to come up with all sorts of things. Someone comes to you and says, is this chicken kosher? You have to give them an answer. You can't go ahead and say, maybe this, maybe that. You need to be very, very straight. You need to make sure to give exactly the halakha as it is. The Rambam's personality was very much about math and science. He was not into poetry at all. Is that maybe one of the influences of the Amuhads? We'll discuss in a little bit. So this next part of our lecture tonight comes specifically from this amazing book that I mentioned before, Maimonides in His World. Maimonides in His World. Because in 1148, the Rambam's Cordoba was conquered by this person named Ibn Tumrat. Well, it was really his, his student, but he was really the person in charge of coming up with this idea of the Amohads. And what exactly does it even mean? What exactly are the Amohads? And this is... This is, I hope, to be a small corrective. Because the way that I was always taught as a kid is that the Amohads were this fanatical, crazy group of people 
who didn't really understand much, and to use a Hebrew term, they were Amaya Aretz. They didn't really understand much because they were Berbers coming from North Africa. But in reality, they actually did have a very, very impressive society. So much so that their main person, Ibn Tumart, happened to learn, according to legend, by Al-Ghazali, who was one of the most important of the Islamic, most important of the Islamic theologians. So, so much so that he had a big impact on Thomas Aquinas. So we're not talking about some sort of group that doesn't know any learning and doesn't understand things. So Ibn Tumar's belief is that, and this is exactly what the term Amohad means. It means Muwahidun, which comes from the word Yehud. I know, I don't know if I did that correctly. It comes from the word Yehud. Those who profess the unity of God. And this is what the Amohads used to make themselves different than everyone else. They said that we believe in the absolute oneness of God. Now, what does that imply? The implication is, is that the other groups, the Almoravids, that they believe in multiple gods. But we know that's not true. We know that in Islam, they are monotheistic. They only believe in one God. So what does it mean that they're calling themselves that we believe in unity? The answer is, and this is very interesting, hopefully it's already setting off some bells in your head if you know about the Rambam, that already is telling you that they only believe that God is one and you cannot ascribe any sort of emotion and you can't ascribe any sort of being to God. It is impossible to do so. And that means that any time where the Quran discusses the hand of God or discusses God's anger or God's love, none of it is meant to be literal. None of it at all. They were extremely, extremely straight and literal about that. They were very, very strong about that. They were called these believers, meaning that those who oppose them really believe in this type of anthropomorphic view of God. The Almoravid losses in Al-Andalus was due to their religiosity, according to Almohads. The reason why they lost so much of Spain is because of their false belief in the being of God, that they need to have a very orthodox attitude as to what God is. In addition, the Amohaz disagreed with the Maliki school. Now this is a little bit too in there. I'm actually gonna skip this part a little bit. But what the Malikis believed is that you can have certain things, maybe we'll call it in like a Hebrew term, Sorat Haklal. They believe that there are certain times that you can override Islamic law if people need it. Like we have a term called Shat Haddechak, where there are certain times that we understand the halacha can be very straight about things, but sometimes the halacha can really be flexible. Sometimes it's able to. In Islam, this Maliki school, even until today, even until today is very influential. So for example, according to Islam, you cannot have any sort of saving banks. You're not allowed to have insurance according to straight Islam. Also, what about the role of women? These are all things that could be changed with the Maliki school with a different way of understanding. The Amohads were totally against this. The Amohads said, no, you have to go back to the Quran and only what the Quran says is what we care about. So this wasn't the Amohads' greatest innovation. The Amohads' greatest innovation was the fact that they said you cannot have any non-believers in Islam in Al-Andalus, in North Africa, in the Maghreb. You can't have it anywhere. And that's what they're most famous about. And the biggest question is, why? Why were they so against it? It seems like it goes directly against what the Quran said, what the Pact of Omar says, that guarantees religious rights to those people, the Al-Khatab. Al What's going on? How could the Amohads disagree so strongly with it? So one of the ideas that's brought down in a fantastic footnote in this book, Maimonides in His World, is that they believed that they wanted to turn their land just like an area called the Hejaz. The Hejaz is the holiest area according to Islam. It's the holiest area, and according to strict Quranic verse, you are not allowed to have people who are unbelievers, non-Muslims, in this area. 
So in order for them to, and they believe this, according to this theory, is that they were trying to make it that all Andalus, that Spain would be similar to the Jazz. And therefore, you're not allowed to have any Jews, any Christians in this area. You're not allowed to. And they persecuted particularly badly. If you take a look at source one, source one, Solomon Yehuda Kohen of Sijomasa. If you take a look, source one on page one. It says, you will want to know the news from the Maghreb, which will cause the ears of all who hear it to burn. After that, he, Abd al-Mamun, he was the main disciple of Ibn Tumar, and he conquered Thamsin, which is a city in Algeria, and killed those within it except for those who transgressed. That is, convert to Islam. After he entered the city of Sijamasa, which is in Morocco, he gathered all the Jews and offered them the option of transgressing. And after seven months of enticing them, during all of which time they fasted and prayed, one of the officers came and demanded they transgress. They declined, and 150 Jews were slaughtered for the unity of God's name. They died al Kiddush Hashem. And the remainder transgressed. The first of the transgressors was Yosef ben Imran, the Dayan of Sijil Masa. For this I mourn and cry, and the communities of Maghreb were all destroyed on account of their sins. Not one remained, bearing a Jewish name. Those who were killed were killed, and those who transgressed, transgressed. And then you have the next source, source two, which is Abraham ben, du ben Daoud in his Sefer Kabbalah. He says, after the demise of the Rimi Gash, there were years of war, evil decrees and persecutions that overtook the Jews who were compelled to wander from their homes. Those destined for death to death. For those for the sword to the sword. Those for the starvation to starvation. Those for captivity to captivity. To Yirmiyahu's prophecy, there was now added such as were destined to leave the faith. This happened in the wake of the sword of Ibn Tumart, and you could continue. It's really sad. And the question is, why? Why? It might be exactly over here that they believe that you're not allowed to be one of these people who are non-Muslim in their particular area. So what does this all mean for the Rambam? What does this all mean for the Rambam? And it's a real question, because here is where we get into the really, you know, this we get into the weeds of a very, very controversial historical topic that I do feel, you know, we can talk about, but hopefully I'll do it in a, in a pretty good way. There are only two ways of looking at this, basically, if you think about this. The Rambam's family lived for 17 years under al Mohad rule. And the question is, what happened to them and how did they survive that time? So, Derech won. The first way of understanding it is that the Rambam's family converted. That's the very first idea. I'm just going to lay it out there. We're going to go way more into this. The second idea is, is that the Rambam's family did not convert and they moved from place to place to try to run away and to try to get away from it. So perhaps the Rambam's family didn't convert. It's entirely possible because maybe they evaded the Amohad persecution. And there's a professor named Professor Halbadal. He has in his book on Maimonides, he says something fascinating. He says, this first source that tells us all about Yosef ben Imran, who was the Dayan of Sijil Masa, that made so much news. Everyone talked about it. People couldn't believe that a Dayan would convert to Islam. If a Dayan, who once again, big time in Chacham, but if someone like him made national news, oh my, if the Rambam converted, how much more so, call the home air, how much more so we would know about the Rambam's conversion. That's number one. In addition, in addition, Professor Halbadal also says that the Rambam gained many enemies, both in Egypt and also in Babylonia, because he disagreed with the Geonim in Babel. And many of these people who hated the Rambam would have taken any opportunity. They would have done anything to go ahead and drag his name in the mud. If he converted, that means that they would have used that as ammo against the Rambam. And also, as suggested by one historian in New York, which I was watching, I won't name, but they said that it might be that it's like the Mormons, that the Muslims, they want to take the Rambam, they want the Rambam to join their team, which means many years later, 
they wrote about how the Rambam converted, and very much it's like a, uh, you know, a post-mortem conversion. And therefore the Rambam never converted, but according to their sources, he did. So that's one way of looking at it, absolutely. But there is an alternate route of looking at it. And this is very interesting. If you take a look at source three, at source three, you have a source called, his name is Ibn al-Kifti, and he wrote a book called The History of the Scientists. And here he talks about the Rambam. I didn't bring you the entire source, but I'll read some of it. When this command was issued, those with little to lose left, but those with burdens, covetous of their families and wealth, outwardly professed Islam and concealed their unbelief. Musa bin Maimon, that's the Rambam, was one of those who did this in his country and stayed there. He publicly performed the rites of Islam. He adhered to their details in recitation and prayer. And he did that until the opportunity for travel presented itself. He departed from al Andalus to Egypt with his family and settled in the city of Fustat among his Jews and made manifest his religion. So we already have a source that's contemporary. We have a source from someone at the time of the Rambam saying that the Rambam converted. In addition, he has more to the story. He says that there was an enemy of the Rambam who came to visit Egypt and he sees the Rambam and he says, I thought you were Muslim. And the Rambam was very scared because this person went over to the Qadi, went over to the leader and said, this person converted. He converted to Islam and now he's back as a Jew. That's a capital offense. Doesn't he deserve death? But yet the Qadi said, that was under al muhad We all know in Islam that forceful, forceful conversions are not effective, and therefore he can go back to being Jewish, and therefore I'm going to decide, I'm going to make an executive choice that the Rambam shall continue to live. The Rambam is going to live. So this is what we have already in sources from the time of the Rambam. Also, we have Jewish sources from that period, that talks about the forced conversions of entire Jewish communities. Yet for some reason, we can't find, aside from that Rav Yosef of Sijamasa, we can't find one individual who converted. That's very interesting. We understand why that's the case, because it's embarrassing. It's not so good. It's horrible. And for that reason, we hear so much about huge communities being forced to convert but never of individuals, never of individuals. And that's, that would also explain Dr. Habadal, he brings this proof. He says, this one Diane we heard about, what about the Rambam? People would have used it as ammo against the Rambam. However, there were so many people with so many issues, every family had issues. So therefore, if anyone were to actually accuse the Rambam, it could easily boomerang and really hurt one's own family because there wasn't really a family that didn't deal with these types of issues. So in addition, in addition, there were exemptions that were given. And I've heard this. There were exemptions given. Maybe the Rambam got an exemption. The problem is, if you take a look at the sources, the only exemptions were really given to a small cadre of Italian merchants who were really in the North African harbors. Aside from them, they were really the only ones. So forced converts were expected to attend, attend mosque and to learn the Quran. A colleague of Avram ben Arambam, the Rambam's son, his name is Ibn Abi Asubia. He recorded the Rambam, and ostensibly he heard this from the Rambam's son, that he said the Rambam knew all of Quran by heart and engaged in Islamic law. It's very interesting. In the words of my great teacher, Rabbi Dr. David Katz, this actually makes the Rambam's accomplishments so much more impressive. Because the Rambam, if we go along, and once again, I can't make this more clear. There are two ways of looking at it. Historians debate this. But if we do say the Rambam did convert, it means he mastered Shah's while hiding. It means he was an expert in everything, in all of the Torah, and he gained all of this while being persecuted. He gained all of it while running away. It's really a very, very, very impressive thing. Very, very impressive. So I present these two different mahalchim. If a person wants to choose either one, I'm perfectly okay. I mean, each one has its own size. So there's another question. And the question is, 
did the did the Amohads, whether you say he converted or not, did the Amohads have any sort of influence on the Rambam's thought? Did it have any sort? And here's where we quote again from Professor Shrumsa. So she writes that there's a few places. Number one is the Rambam. The Rambam wrote an amazing sefer called the Misha Torah. And the Rambam himself knew how important it was. If you take a look at source five, he writes to his student, I urge you not to neglect the study of this book until you apprehend all of it. Make it your own book. Teach it everywhere to disseminate its usefulness. For the purpose intended in composing the Talmud was lost and has vanished. The purpose of the erudite today is to waste time in Talmudic discussions as if the purpose and intention was solely to exercise polemical skills. This, however, was not the first intention. Discussions and polemics occurred only accidentally. Therefore, I was moved to recall the first purpose, to facilitate the task of remembering it, and furthermore, to make it known, for it has been lost among all polemical words. The Rambam is saying something quite drastic. He's saying that those people who sit and learn the Gemara, the Gemara is important, but really the important thing is getting to a din, is getting to a straight halacha, is getting to, in fact, take a look at source six. This is the Rambam writing earlier in a Sefer HaMitzvot, which was written in Arabic. I saw fit to prepare also a composition that includes all the laws and precepts of the Torah and to proceed as I am wont to do, namely to avoid mentioning disagreements and positions that were rejected and to list only finite rulings. And I also opt for omitting justifications or arguments in support of each ruling and the names of their transmitters. This is exactly why the Rambam got into trouble. The Rambam wrote a sefer called Misha Torah. What does Misha Torah mean? It means a second Torah. That's what it means. The Rambam writes in his introduction, uh, in his sefer, in Misha Torah, on source seven, it says, therefore I have called this text Misha Torah, the second to the Torah, with the intent that a person should first study the written law and then study this text and comprehend the entire oral law from it without having to study any other text between the two. What the Rambam is saying over here, if you want to finish the entire Torah, it's very simple. All you have to do is finish all of Tanakh and then finish his Sefer, his 14 books, and you finish the entire Torah. In fact, Rav Soloveitchik says something beautiful. If you take a look at the Rambam's writing about Hanukkah. The Rambam gives a whole history lesson about Hanukkah. And in Hare Kedem, Kedem written by Rav Shurkin, he asks a great question for Rav Why exactly does the Rambam become a historian immediately? Why is the Rambam bringing the story of Hanukkah? And he points to this line. He says, because the Rambam says that the only way to learn this story is by learning the Gemara, by learning the Gemara in Shabbos, Tav Chav Beis, my Hanukkah. Learn about Hanukkah. But yet if you're reading my book, you're missing out on that. The only way to learn about it is by me telling you about it. This is what the Rambam's intention was. I will also say, to quote also from Rabbi Dr. David Katz, the point was to be a middle brow. It was meant to be a compendium for most people. Even the Rambam himself didn't think that the top people should only read his book, but he felt like that he wanted to raise the level of the people who were lower, and the way to do that is by helping them and by having them understand the straight halakha without any of the discussions. What's so interesting is, is that the Rambam, which is supposed to be so clear, the Rambam, which is supposed to be just the halakha, think about how many works have spawned just from the Rambam, literally hundreds. The Rambam want to be the last word, Instead, there's so, so much, including brisk, like we mentioned before. So, that's number one. Professor Shusma says something else. She also says that within an actual work, within the actual work, the Rambam writes philosophical and theological ideas as they are. What's interesting about Judaism Judaism has never really cared so much about belief. Now, obviously, a person needs to believe, but it doesn't really, how's Mashiach? Who's Mashiach? How's it going to work out? In reality, even the Rambam says we're not sure. But what the Rambam does, the Rambam is the first one to write theological beliefs as if they're halacha. 
and put them into an entire Sefer of Halacha. In fact, even during his time, the entire Sefer Amada was, was uh, critiqued because people disagreed with what he was writing over there. Where did this and this come from? Where did writing just the straight halakha and where did writing theological positions within his work come from? According to Professor Shumsa, it comes from Ibn Tumart. The Ibn Tumart wrote a whole compendium and what did he put in there? He disagreed like we mentioned before with all of the Maliki casuistry. He goes back and forth. He says, this is the law, this is the din, this is how you have to do it, and that's it. And in addition, Ibn Tumar in his book writes theological positions along with straight law, along with law. In addition, anthropomorphism. Where does the Rambam get this idea? Where does the Rambam get this idea that you can't believe in any sort of physical quality of God? The most, one of the most famous lines of the Ravid if you take a look at source eight, if you take a look at source eight, source eight is Rambam Hechot Teshuvah, where he writes, five are called minim, five are called people who don't believe and don't get olam haba. And if you look at the last line, it says, one who says that there is one master, but he is a body and subject to the picture. The Rambam says you're not allowed to believe. When the Torah says, Yad Chazaka, you're not allowed to think about a hand. The Rambam says, when you think about God, you're not allowed to think of an old man with a beard. You're not allowed to. The Ribid right over here says, in Source 9, why does he call this individual a min? When several who are greater and better than he, he's referring to the Rambam, guides it. I mean, have followed this opinion based on what they saw in biblical verses and all the more on what they saw in the words of the Agadot that confused the mind. The Ribid says, if a person reads the Torah and comes to the conclusion that maybe God can take a physical form, what's so wrong with that? There were greater people than the Rambam who believed that. How can the Rambam say that that person is a min? According to Professor Shumsa, she says, where did this come from? It came from the Almohads, because the Almohads were so against any sort of attribution. They were against any sort of discussion of anthropomorphism, and therefore, it had to be, had to be just exactly the way as the Rambam says. And even now, I mean, it's very, very difficult the, the way to think about how the Rambam really believes. It's, it's very, very difficult to get to that level. And what the Rambam expects of people to rise to that level is a very, very, very high level. The last thing that, that she writes in this chapter, she calls the chapter, was the Rambam an Almohad fundamentalist. It's all about the Messianic Mahdi. The Rambam writes in his Sefer that the Messiah, that Mashiach, is going to win wars. He's going to be a physical person. He's going to unite the Jewish people, but he writes specifically as a warrior. Where does the Rambam get this from? Now, there are sources, obviously, in Masech Sanhedrin and Perachelech, but according to, according to Professor Shrumsa, she says, that this, this idea about a messianic mahdi, this idea about having someone come and really take the charge, obviously was in the air, it was in the culture, and therefore she says, that's why the Rambam prefers that interpretation versus others, versus others. So the question is, is we've seen already, perhaps the Rambam converted, perhaps the Rambam didn't convert, we saw four different areas where the Rambam might, might, and once again, a lot of this is conjecture. A lot of this isn't necessarily written in stone. It's just interesting ideas. However, what exactly are the Rambam's feelings about forced conversions? What exactly? If the Rambam underwent a, false com uh, a, a forced conversion, what exactly would be, would be the consequences of such? So there happens to be something called the Shahada. The Shahada, according to Muslims, I bear witness that there is no God besides Allah. The Rambam, when he writes about God, he uses the word Allah. It just means God. The second part is obviously going to be the part that's a lot more difficult for us. And I bear witness that Muhammad and his servant is his servant a messenger. That according to Muslims, Muhammad is the last prophet, Muhammad is the true prophet, and everything after the Quran is really, that's what really matters. And everything, anything before, that we maybe corrupted things, that we corrupted things. So 
The Rambam says something really, really interesting in his Igeret Hashmad. There was a time, unfortunately, in 1165, in 1165, where the Rambam was written a letter from one person, and this person said, I asked this great Sadiq, I asked this great person, what is my status? Unfortunately, I had to falsely convert, and I want to know what is my status. And this person, who's unnamed, and the Rambam doesn't name him, this person says, you are terrible. You converted to Islam. Don't you know converting to Islam is a vodazara? Don't you know that according to the Gemara Masech Sanhedrin, a person needs to give up their life? And not only that, this is a time of persecution, which means that if it's a time of persecution, the Gemara says that a person is not even able to change their shoelace if the non-Jews want to change that. So therefore, they're telling this whole community, there's this, this, this one person is saying, you guys did wrong. And not only that, he goes even further. He says, you guys never could be witnesses. Also, in addition, any missus you do are actually negative. And not only that, any prayers you do are actually a to'eva, are actually an abomination. Better not to even daven. And people, they couldn't believe this. People got this. And who did they ask? They asked the Rambam. They asked the Rambam exactly what he believed. And the Rambam very strongly disagrees. He very, very strongly disagrees. And the Rambam says two main arguments. And we're going to go through this very, very quickly. The Rambam says that dying al Kiddush Hashem, in the case of the Amohads, you don't have to do. And why is that? If you take a look at source 10, the Rambam, this is from his letter, Igeret Hashmad, which is the very first letter in this fantastic safer, Igeret HaRambam. It's amazing. He writes, you should know that in the previous persecutions in the days of the sages, our people were called to transgress the law in action. But during the period of religious persecution, we are not forced to perform any acts of apostasy, but just to recite the empty formula. For this form of compulsion requires no action, but the recital of a simple formula, which the Muslims themselves know was uttered insincerely, only to circumvent the king's whims. So the Rambam says that if he were asked what to do, he said you should actually recite the Shada and you should live. That's number one. And number two, the Rambam says that those Moroccan Jews, those Moroccan Jews who did convert, and those Spanish Jews, they convert, they didn't do anything wrong. And their tefillah is still a beautiful tefillah. And their davening is great. And their learning is great. And any mitzvot they can do, is all incredible, and they should continue. And the very first opportunity they have to leave the persecution, they should do that. That's what the Rambam writes. But the Rambam says they are perfectly okay, and they chose the right thing. In fact, the Rambam later will write a Mishnah Torah. He's going to say that if it's a case where a person shouldn't have given up their life, and they give up their life, the Rambam speaks very harshly about this person and says the person should continue living. He gives up his life if he gives up his life in a way that he shouldn't have done. What that means is he's punished for giving up his life when he shouldn't have. So there are many halachic abnormalities with the Garrett Hashmad. There are many halachic abnormalities. Number one is, is the Rambam talks about how all we need to do is just say something. That's all we have to do, right? And the person gets around. But isn't that? really problematic because the Gemara in Sanhedrin says a person can worship a Vodazara just with their mouth. That's number one. In addition, the Rambam never goes into whether or not Islam is a Vodazara. You would think this would be exactly what we would talk about. But instead of quoting all sorts of ideas about Islam being a monotheistic religion, instead he quotes all sorts of Midrashim. He quotes all sorts of Agadic texts which don't have the same halachic rigor. And also, his argument that speech without action, it doesn't, how, how exactly does it end up ever working? Because it means that any time a person is forced, they don't believe it. So when do you ever have a case of someone dying al-Kiddush Hashem? Because 
In all of these cases, if a person needs to profess a different God, obviously the person who's forcing the person to say it obviously knows that the person doesn't mean it. So what kind of halachic argument is the Rambam saying that if I say it, I don't mean it. The Muslims also know I don't mean it. How do you ever have a case of dying al Kiddush Hashem? Because in every case of persecution, it's obvious that those people who are persecuting know that the people don't want to accept it. So when would you ever have a case of dying al Kiddush Hashem, which is one of the big three? So you have a big, big, big machloket between two titans. Number one is Professor Chaim Soloveitchik. Fantastic. I love him. And also Professor Rabbi Dr. David Hartman, who passed away in 2013. He started the Shalom Hartman Institute. Learned by Chaim Berlin. Learned by Chaim Berlin. So there's a big fight about this particular letter. And the question is this. The question is, was the letter meant to be a halachic text? Was it meant to be something that a person should follow? Was it really meant to be that way? Professor Chaim Soloveitchik says, based on all of what we just said right now, of course it's not. The Rambam doesn't say anything halachic in the letter. Nothing. It's all beautiful. It's all fantastic. To quote the Rambam, I mean to quote Professor Soloveitchik, as a legal defense, the Gerd Ashmad is inexplicable, but not as a work of rhetoric. In the classic and medieval sense of the term, as a pamphlet aimed not at truth, but at suasion, at moving people by all means at hand towards a given course of action. The Gerrit Hashmad is not a halachic work, but a response, not a responsum, but to use a modern term, a propagandist track, written with a single purpose in mind, to counteract the effects of a letter of indictment that had gained great currency and threatened to wreak havoc on the Moroccan community. That's what Professor Soloveitchik writes. It was never ever, ever meant as a halachic way, it was propaganda. And that's okay, because so many Jews were teetering on the edge. So many Jews, and we have records of this, were saying, if we're so close, if we're being told that, that any mitzvot that we do are an abomination, any prayers we do are an abomination, I'll just go the whole way. Why not just convert to Islam? It's just much easier that way. What the Rambam did, and he's going to do it again later, with the Gerrit Teman. He saves the Jewish community. He saves this whole community with this beautiful persuasion. On the other end of the spectrum is, is Dr. Hartman. And Dr. Hartman says that, of course, it's halachic. Because take a look at all of the halachic rabbis who quoted it. There was the great Rivash. There was also, there was also, Rav Avad Yosef quotes it as halachic. The Tzitz Eliezer quotes it as halachic. Many, many great rabbis quoted as a halachic source, and he deals with it, and he says a lot of it has to do with the whole character of what halacha is according to the Rambam. According to the Rambam, halacha is important, but it's a means to become a greater person. So Dr. Harmon wants to say that, that if there is something that's getting in the way, therefore, you can basically put it to the side right now. We're not going to care about the halachic point right now, but we care more about what exactly is going to happen, you know, what's going to be the result, basically. And the result is that the Jewish people will stay together. That's what he writes. However, however one takes the halachic legitimacy of the letter, the work did have its intended effect. It did. And therefore, the Rambam, therefore, the Rambam saved the Jewish people. And Jews who were on this precipice of conversion, who were thinking about converting, they reverted away from it, and he was able to save so many Jews. And the question is, what would have happened if the Rambam would have been lost to history? What would have happened if the Rambam, unfortunately, would have died? What would have happened if he would have been killed, al Kiddush Hashem? So there's a few different things. The professor, Menachem Kellner, he just came out with a new article in tradition. And with this will end, with this will end. He says there are five major things that if you don't have the Rambam, you don't have. Number one is the Shulchan Aruch. Without the Rambam making a system of halacha, you never ever have the halachic development of systemizing the halacha. And that saved so many different issues because now you can have a Shulchan Aruch, now you can have something that people follow, 
without having to worry about, am I doing the right thing? Without having to be an expert in the whole gamut, you are able to know exactly what the Shulchan Arach says. Because it's comprehensive, its laws are very straight, and it happens to be, it happens to be systematic. In addition, you don't have an orthodoxy without the Rambam. Like we mentioned before, the Rambam is the very first one to write that there are theological ideas and theological creeds that are part of halacha. They need to be part of halacha. And for that reason, we have these ideas of what is in the machane, what's in the camp, what is proper belief, and what is not proper belief. In fact, the Rambam, even subsequent to his time, the Sar Mikutsi, Ramosha Mikutsi, he traveled to Spain subsequent to the Rambam, and he was going around, and he saw a major issue. People weren't putting on tefillin anymore. People weren't putting on mezuzot. When he asked why that was the case, they said, I already know the reason to put on tefillin. It's to get close to God. I don't need tefillin. So you already see there's a pretty big issue with what the Rambam wants to say in terms of having these ideas. But when the Rambam writes it in a halachic way, when he writes it over here, it is exactly as it should be. It's exactly as it should be. And therefore, we have that type of orthodoxy. And we have exactly what's binding. Also, the Rambam has this idea where you have the study of Torah and the study of the cosmos, where you have both together. Without the Rambam, it's very, very difficult about thinking about being in the modern world, of learning about the world and getting close to God through learning about the world. In addition, you also don't have rationalism. The Rambam was really the rationalist par excellence, as we discussed. He was against anthropomorphism. He writes so much about the ta'ameha mitzvot, about reasons for a mitzvot. He has very rationalistic reasons behind things. And without the Rambam, where on earth would that come from? But also in addition, every single thing has an effect. And the effect that the Rambam had with his very strong rationalism is that Kabbalah burst it to the surface. And that's why it's so beautiful that tonight's your Kislev, tonight's the night that the Alter Rebbe got out of jail, because here you have this stream of Kabbalah, which maybe without the Rambam, would never have existed, would never have come out because the rationalism of the Rambam needed a counterweight. And that counterweight was the Kabbalah. And last of all, we wouldn't have our idea of Mashiach. Mashiach, in terms of the Rambam, takes all of the sources of Mashiach and systemizes it. And he brings down a rationalistic way to understand Mashiach, like we discussed with the Messianic Mahdi. He brings down a way that Mashiach could work here and now. That now opens the door for religious nationalism, for our amazing state of Israel, for Bezrat Hashem, the thought of Rav Kook, and Bezrat Hashem, hopefully, please God, we shall have Mashiach come as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night.